Periodic, par parenthetically, I'm going to throw this in there. If you think this response to COVID-19 is only a health care crisis, study the French Revolution and please wake up. So in a nutshell, you will see the context of the beginning of the time of the end. God splits church and state. Thank God for America. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's the American God-given principles of our founding document of separation of church and state. Not separation of God and state, but those principles. Those principles are what has kept the wound from healing. Amen. As soon as those principles are gone and they're being swept out the door as fast as you can blink your eyes, then the wound will be healed. Amen. It's not, it's not, it's not rocket science. So I know I hate to say this. No, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy, I don't understand some of our leaders. Just don't get it. So in 1798, God is raising up a haven for religious and civil liberty in McCall, the United States. It is spread to other countries in the world, particularly the West, by the way. A haven that was integral. This haven was integral to the religious awakening in America with the Millerite movement. Mm. Yeah. The Millerite movement couldn't have begun in France, but it began here. Amen. Amen. And it was popped up throughout the world. Because you see, Jesus was getting ready to go into the most holy place in 1844 and buying this thing off. Amen. And we're still fiddling around here 176 years later while Rome burns. We're fiddling. At the same time that the Middle Earth movement was popping up, the devil, the enemy of all souls, was rearing his head, as I've already mentioned, in France as he co-opted liberty and God's law as the foundation and flipped freedom on its head and made it licentiousness. Abortion? Check. Same-sex marriage with open support of homosexuality? Check. A double standard of justice? Check. Make law and order an enemy of license? Check. And more. Every principle of God-given reason and revelation and common sense that is being done to death in America today was on steroids in the French Revolution and is coming more here. It's the template for our day. And I'm not the, I'm not the, you know, you know who I first begin to understand this in greater depth with? That it's the template? Connecting a couple of Catholic scholars with Illinois. Hmm. One of the best thinkers on this I know is a guy, his older name, his name is Angelo Covia. He's a, he was immigrated from Italy when he was 12 years old. He said, these millennials and all these people rioting today, this is a recent quote, I'm paraphrasing. He says, they're not, what they really hate is this civilization. What they really hate are the principles that made the civilization what it is. That's what they really hate. That's Catholic, he said. He'll be with us. He'll displace somebody that's out there among us. Or his ilk will. Ellen, in 1888, wrote these words about the French Revolution. Please get, don't let the wind go, but if you haven't read that chapter on the French Revolution, the great controversy in the last 30 minutes, <laughs> read it, read it soon. She wrote these words. The fatal error which wrought such woe for the inhabitants of France was the ignoring of this one great truth. That true freedom lies within the prescriptions, that is, the boundaries of the law of God. Ooh. Amen. Ooh. Great Converse 285. And this quote from the same book, a little bit later in the book, 584, I believe. When the divine precepts are rejected, sin ceases to appear. Sinful. Mm. Or righteousness desirable. You want to be a good boy? Yeah. 
Those, she went on, those who refuse to submit to the government of God, boy, this is really double capitalized for all of us Americans. Those who refuse to submit to the government of God are wholly, completely unfitted to govern themselves. Whew. Was she inspired or what? Amen. This is our day. This is our day. Lift up your heads, your redemption, redemption draw it nigh. Hallelujah. This is our day. One more. You ready? One more from her. This is 1903. This is quite a bit later. From the Great Controversy. In the book, Education, page 228. God's servant is warning, in my opinion, about progressive leftism. Progressiveness, without using the term. Compassion. She warns about an ideology that, that, will, that says that each mind must judge itself. Mm -hmm. You don't like your gender? I'm adding this. You don't like your gender today? It's okay. She's warning about that. Each mind will judge itself. True knowledge, says this ideology, places men above the law. Law for thee, but license for me. Another one that she's worried about, concerned about, this was growing in her day. This was growing in her day. God does not condemn. It matters not what you do. Live as you please. You know the term that she put on that? I call it progressive leftism today. You know the term that she used? Blow in your mind. She called it spiritualism. She goes on. Where are the safe? This is her wondering out loud here. Where are the safeguards of virtue? What is to prevent the world from becoming a second Sodom? 1903. Has it? Yes. The same teachings that led, she says, she you know, I'm not done with her yet. The same teachings that led to the French Revolution are tending to lead the world in a struggle similar to that which convulsed France. Wow. Can anyone say Portland? Mm -hmm. Now with the backdrop, we are going to spend about 10 minutes in Revelation 17. Please go there. Because this is the part that's really new. I couldn't be sharing what I just shared as forcefully as I just did and I was going to be quiet. If I hadn't seen what I now see in Revelation 17. Thanks to Brother George McCready Christ. And I remember my, my daddy had been dead for 61 years. Yeah, 61 years. My daddy had been dead. I remember my dad mentioning that man by name. George McCready. Does anybody else remember that name, George McCready Price? <laughs> Most of our scholars have relegated him to the dust bin of history. But I'm going to tell you, he could outdo any of those that I know today. Amazing man. For those of you from Canada, he was born in New Brunswick. I just thought I'd throw that in there. Revelation 17. <clears throat> wow. Wow. Then one of the first verse, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls. John just gave us the context. He said it's end times. He doesn't give us the date. He doesn't talk about 1798 here. Daniel did that. This is the time of the end. But watch this. So, who had the seven bowls came and talked with me. So it was one of the angels who poured out a play. So it's end time scenario. So John wants you to see this as set. He wants you to see it as an end time scenario. Come, and I will show you the judgment of the great whore, the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the king of the earth committed fornication. There's that illicit state and church, okay? And the inhabitants of the world were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. 
So they, so he carried me away in the wilderness, he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. So here's a church sitting on a country or a, or a nation, you might say. Or, or. So a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, a nation which was full of names and blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, unlike the white robe of Christ's righteousness of his pure bride. So much of this is, I'm just going to skim over the top. Having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication, her illicit relationship with separation of church and state. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the common of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with amazement. But the angel said to me, verse 7, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery. I will tell you the mystery, the hidden truth of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and ten horns. Just one more verse and I'll start my comment. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world and they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Does that sound a little confusing? It was to me. Was, is not, and yet is. I'm going to read a couple more verses. Here's the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. Now, if this is the time of in chronology here, see if this makes sense. Five are fallen. Okay, five of the seven are gone. Number six, at the end time, John says, is. But then he is going to be displaced by the last one, number seven. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. There's seven heads. Seven heads. Historically, with a couple of exceptions, if you read Ellen White carefully, she doesn't agree with our modern historians, our modern scholars on Revelation 17. Stephen Haspel, one of our pioneers, would. McCready lays it out. George McCready Price. Okay? The five that are fallen. What are the five that are fallen? Go back to your beast in Revelation on Daniel chapter 2. I mean, go ahead and go back to the image. That'd be easier. Go back to the image. Which is the first one? Adam. Adam. You know what our scholars say? Assyria. And they keep the heat off. Yeah. Babylon. What came? Who defeated Babylon? Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia. Who defeated Medo-Persia? Greece. Greece. Who defeated Medo? Or who absorbed? You might say Greece. Rome. Pagan Rome. And who absorbed? Or pagan Rome? Papal. Papal Rome. Five are fallen. So when is he talking about? He's talking about the time of the end. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. French Revolution, you know, took it to the end of the Pope. So five are fallen. And what is? What is the one that is? Christ. United States. Technically, the French, through Berthier, took down the Pope. But who's kept the Pope down? The United States. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You, yeah, I guess you could say the West has, but yeah. the exemplar of the West is the United States of America. And as long as those, this is my key point, 
as long as those principles of religious and civil liberties as outlined in the Declaration and the Constitution are in play, he will stay down. Amen. But as soon as we let those go, number seven is on the way. And he rules a short time. Read on through the passage. I'm going to try to line this down. I hope that makes sense. Number seven will be a rejuvenated number five. Number five was a page, see? Number seven will be a rejuvenated number five. Good. And we're right on the verge of it. Healed. The healing. The healing. It'll be healed. It'll be healed when, when there's no opposition to him. We're the opposition. The principles of America. Oh, I can I can I can easily find, because I've got it in my notes, easily find what what some of the popes have said about American founding principles they despise it keeps them at bay. It keeps the deadly wound unhealed. Amen. Yeah. Popes back in the 19th century, even today. And I, I got one more little secret for you. I don't think you'll see this, but I always, I've only seen one place. There are some people that I really respect who say, well, Dale, don't you know that in Vatican I, that's 1962. Some of you are still alive like me. 1962 to 1965. Vatican I, John the 23rd. Did you know that they declared their for religious liberty? Yeah. yeah. And I was seduced by that for about a few, six months. And then I read from their own words, you have religious liberty, but not for heresy. Mm -hmm. You have religious liberty. Sure you do. Not for heresy, who determines what is her heretical? The Vatican does. So now they still hate it. It's keeping them down. That's why they've worked so hard to infiltrate America with their with their ideas, ideology, yeah. and teaching. In fact, the Jesuits are the champion, but I'm not going to get too deep into that. <laughs> By the way, the, did you know the Jesuit ideology was formed at the University of Paris originally back in this? Uh, 16th century. And they took it to Spanish to Spain and they perfected it through the Spanish Inquisition, which is the worst Inquisition in the history of mankind. Yeah. And by the way, do you know how they argue now that they that they never really killed anybody or persecuted anybody to death? Is because they pronounced the system, but the state carried it out. So we didn't do it. That's sinister. That's sinister. So please keep in mind, when you, number the, when you identify these heads, it matters where you start. And the reason the Syrian and Egypt doesn't work for me any longer, even though our scholars still stand by it, including a couple of friends of mine, is because the Syrian and, and Egypt were actually part of the original Babylon in the sense because the original Babylon began at Nimrod, Nimrod's day at the Tower of Egypt. So Syria and Egypt are just minor players. In comparison to the world powers that came on the scene. So you all are going to want this book. And then you put it down by the word of God. And if it doesn't fit for you, then throw it out. Yes. Let me see if I can. Just a reminder. Babylon was defeated by Medo Persia. Medo Persia was defeated by Greece which was conquered by pagan Rome, which is absorbed, is the way I like to put it, by papal Rome, and it was taken down technically by Berthier in 1798, simply in the time of the end. And we're in that time right now, number six. So logically, the seventh head in the final kingdom would, before Jesus returns would be a rejuvenated and fully healed papacy who will get his power from the sixth head. Revelation 13, who gives the power back to the beast? The second one of Revelation 13, which is the false prophet, as I sometimes refer to us, is the United States. We're not the false prophet yet, but we're almost there. Yeah. We're almost there. 
The more you celebrate, when you see the celebration of the takedown of American founding principles, the more the closer we are to the seventh and final kingdom. But then, but then, Dale, don't you know there's an eighth that goes to perdition? Who's the eighth? What takes place after the millennium? Who is, who is the apex of destruction? Yeah. Lucifer. It's his spirit that has run the previous seven. See, God's spirit, for example, started this country. Satan's spirit is taking it the way it's going right now. And that's what makes it the false prophet. Does that make any sense to you? I've never taught this before. I hope it's making some sense. The bottom line is, how then shall we live? Remember, John is seeing our day. As he writes, five are fallen. One is, that's us. And the other, the seventh, has not yet come. Because it will rain, but just the fact it says an hour. I don't know if that's how to interpret that, but except to say, very shortly will it rain. Cannot arise though until America, as Ellen, Ellen put this, she said, the secret of America's prosperity are these two landlike horns of religious and civil liberty. And when we renounce those, kaboom. She will, according to Revelation 13, then be speaking as a dragon. And the short reign of a rejuvenated papacy. All this can be there. Are you awake? Do you see the progressive government with its promises of security is not the friend of liberty? Mm -hmm. Stacy and I brought about enough little booklets for every one of you to have a copy of it. And that's my last little thing I want to share. On April the 10th, 1954, I'm in fourth grade. There was a sermon or a message, an essay printed, I don't remember if it's Ministry Magazine or the Edmonds Review, by a man that named Carlisle B. Haynes. Do you, you remember that name? Well, you guys are really young. Yeah. <laughs> Carlisle B. Haynes, I think he was a path, he was a preacher at Andrews. And, but he was a preacher that believed in not separation. God and state, but separation of church and state. Most of our people would have to believe in separation of God and state. I don't get it. Not, not Carl L. B. Haynes. He wrote a little book. He wrote a little essay. We had it reprinted. Raymond and uh, It's called Security. Security or Safety. Or Liberty or Safety. It's right there. Whatever it is. So, <laughs> but you can read it in five minutes. And you'll say, we're reading our day. Yeah. And it's 66 years old. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. God had his people here. And most people know who Carl B. Haynes is. It's like they don't know who George McCready Price is. God help us. Our only hope and assurance, brothers and sisters, is found in the light of Calvary, which is the light of liberty. There the broken laws atone for there the sinner is redeemed. He or she are set free to follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Amen. May that be our prayer. Amen. Our reality in Jesus' name. Amen. Because when Jesus bowed His head and died, when Jesus bowed His head and died, I'm quoting that, He bore the pillars of Satan's kingdom with Him to the ground. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's see closing is 604.